We're looking today at the macroeconomic um, controversies of the Keynesian supply curve um, versus the neoclassical approach. So we're looking at the, uh, the, the model that is based on the left, uh, where we have a horizontal part of the supply curve, which becomes vertical. This will become all explained uh, as we move through the presentation. The uh, Keynesian um, economics, uh, the founder was John Maynard Keynes from 1883 to 1946, known as Keynesian economics. He introduced modern macroeconomics and Keynesian policies, and we will see um, what he believed in as we move through this unit. Um, if you look at the economist on the right, he was instrumental after the financial meltdown in um, the 2008 crisis, and he was very much a Keynesian economist in favor of government spending and stimulus spending to kickstart the economy, to deal with unemployment and to get the economy more robust. Um, so Keynes was one of the most famous economists of the 20th century, and his work uh, came to form the basis of modern macroeconomics. Keynes questioned the classical economist's view of the economic system. It's this harmonious system that automatically tends towards full employment or the natural rate of unemployment. This is what a neoclassical perspective is based upon. He said instead that it's possible for economies to, be, to remain in a position of a short-run equilibrium for long periods of time. So in other words, that the economy could remain below full employment um, and, and not have any natural tendency to, to return to the level of full employment. And so Keynesian economics is very much in favor of government intervention in uh, economic uh, times of, of duress and uh, to kickstart the economy. So Keynesian um, supply curve. On this horizontal part of the curve, we're dealing with a lot of spare capacity in the economy, such as during a recession or a depression. And what this means is um, that aggregate demand could be increased. So if this was AD2, um, so aggregate demand can be increased without triggering inflation because there's so many unused machines and plants and there's so many people able and willing to work who can't find jobs that there's no upward pressure on wages. So if a firm wanted to increase its, um, its output, it's not going to have workers clamoring for higher wages because there's so many workers behind them so desperate to get a job, they'd be perfectly happy to get your job at your wage and not ask for more wages. And furthermore, if there's a lot of unused machines and factories and so on, they don't have to um, have any capital outlay of funds to, um, to be able to increase production because they've got these unused machines that, are, that they can readily use without having to, uh, to spend any more money. Um, so, but note, just a, a reminder, the, the neoclassical, um, which is of course what we've seen before, with LAS, aggregate demand, and SAS. So this is the neoclassical model. Um, we can't trigger aggregate demand without triggering, in, triggering inflation. So it's quite a different model. So in this model, since there's no trade-off between inflation and unemployment, un unlike the neoclassical model where there is. You, if you increase aggregate demand, output goes up, unemployment goes down, but inflation goes up. So there, there is a trade-off, but here there is no trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So it's considered desirable, if not even morally imperative, that the government steps in to stimulate um, AD and de decrease unemployment. So again, for this to happen, Moving to AD2, we come to Y2, we've increased output, but the price level has remained the same. If AD is on the horizontal part of the curve, then the economy could still be stable with high unemployment. Um, so the government intervention should be used to reach full employment. So meaning, in other words, if we were operating here, or even if we were operating here, the economy could still be stable with high unemployment, and it could remain stuck there for a very long time. 
So again, this is a second reason why government intervention um, should take place, because high unemployment, and think of the times of the Depression, can be very devastating. And if it can remain stuck there, unlike the neoclassical version, where it will automatically tend to full employment, then that's the second reason why the government should intervene. So one, because if they intervene, they won't trigger inflation. And two, because if they don't intervene, the economy may remain stuck with very high unemployment for a long period of time. As the economy approaches, however, potential output, <clears throat> and the spare capacity is used up, so unemployment is approaching um, the, the natural level or full level of employment, um, the, the, um, all of the machines are being used, the factories are full capacity and so on, the economy's available factors of production become increasingly scarce. As producers continue to try to increase output, they'll have to bid for the increasingly scarce factors. And so what ends up happening as we have aggregate demand increasing as they're competing for the increasingly scarce um, factors of production, it's going to result now in higher prices. So higher prices for the factors of production mean higher costs for the producers, and the price level will also rise to compensate for the higher costs. And so we can see that here, this is PE, we're gonna have P, P, let's call this P2, and again, P3. So as the spare capacity is being used up and they're competing for scarce resources, the prices are going to be driven up because the costs were driven up. It's possible for the economy to reach a point of full employment. So if they're operating here, um, and this is why F, F for being full employment level, which is also the natural rate of unemployment, so it is possible for the economy to reach this point, and when, when the economy is operating at the vertical point of the Keynesian LAS. So remember, when we're dealing with full employment or the natural rate of unemployment, we still have some unemployment um, present. When the economy reaches its full capacity, it's impossible to increase output any further because all of the factors of production are fully employed. So if we were to increase AD, at all, we're not going to be producing more than at the full level of employment because all of our factors of production are being used and we're simply going to trigger inflation. The macroeconomic e equilibrium in the Keynesian perspective is determined by the point of intersection of the aggregate demand curve and the Keynesian aggregate supply curve because remember, it could remain stuck there for a very long period of time. The recessionary gaps can persist over long periods of time. So let's say if we had this happening, AD1, and we've got here a recessionary gap. We know that it can persist over long periods of time if the government doesn't step in and do things like government uh, projects, government spending, stimulus spending, and so on. And the problem in the Keynesian model is caused by insufficient aggregate demand. So the Keynes recommends that the government, um, Keynes recommended, excuse me, that the government intervene in the economy with specific measures to help it come out of the recessionary gap and specifically focusing on AD. How can we get aggregate demand to increase? We can still have show economic growth in the Keynesian perspective. So if we've had an increase or an improvement in the factors of production, we can still increase our um, output from Y1 to Y2 by the graph shifting to the right. So economic growth involving increases in the full employment level of real GDP or potential GDP can be illustrated by rightward shifts in the entire Keynesian aggregate supply curve and the AD curve. So policy implications of the neoclassical and Keynesian perspectives, and I'll let you read this.
According to the neoclassical perspective, so now we're switching, if the government pursues policies to influence aggregate demand, in the short run, these may intensify the business cycle, so make inflationary and deflationary gaps larger. In the long run, they will only result in changes in the price level, because remember, in the long run, we will harmoniously return to the level of full employment or the natural rate of unemployment. And the, um, the price um, may change, but the, uh, but the output will be at that level of full employment. So what governments should do then is encourage competition so that resource and output prices will respond to the forces of supply and demand, allowing the economy to automatically correct short-run inflationary and recession recessionary gaps. And they should adopt the policies that influence the supply side of the economy, which shift the LAS curve to the right, thereby achieving long-run economic growth. So to sort of summarize, According to the neoclassical, if you are um, focusing on aggregate, de aggregate demand, uh, you will not achieve any long-run economic growth where your output is, um, is, is permanently larger. Um, you can only encourage that by shifting the LAS curve to the right. According to Keynesians, though, uh, government policies to influence aggregate demand are imperative, so, so they must do this in order to deal with the short-term fluctuations of the business cycle. Because remember, the economy could remain stuck with high levels of unemployment in the Keynesian model, particularly when the economy is in less than full employment equilibrium, so a recessionary or deflationary gap. The government should intervene with policies that will increase aggregate demand. Otherwise, the economy will remain stuck at low levels of real GDP and high unemployment over long periods of time. This is not a good thing. So the Keynesians believe that efforts should be made to shift the AD curve to the right until it intersects the Keynesian aggregate supply curve at full employment of real GDP. So that's the point where the um, aggregate supply curve starts to become vertical. It's only in the upward sloping and vertical portions of the Keynesian AS curve that further increases in aggregate demand become inflationary. Now we saw that when we had aggregate demand increasing on that vertical portion, we couldn't increase the output. All we were doing was triggering inflation. Now do keep in mind that most economists are unlikely to be purely the one or the other. So unlikely to be purely neoclassical or purely Keynesian in their view of the economy. While likely to side more with one of the other, two perspectives. Many would argue that elements of both perspectives have some merit and that policies attempting to influence both aggregate demand and aggregate supply are important in achieving the goals of reducing short-term fluctuations while promoting economic growth.